there's supposed to be a way to do this. Are you looking up the help? you much.
Yes, Megan. Yeah. Everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, last uh, session of uh, before the unconference today. Um, so uh, we heard some great feedback uh, about some of the um, updates we gave yesterday, and we really just wanted to have an opportunity to provide some more information and give you a little bonus uh, Beth Porter content because she was so popular the first time around. So uh, I'd like to uh, start by introducing our uh, VP of product, Beth Porter. Can you start the presentation for me? Great. I'm using my uh, extra left hand here. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, walk, this was a request that we had from several people to walk through some of the big features that we released last year, and so uh, very swiftly we put together a quick presentation of just all the things that were some real big highlights for our team and uh, represent efforts by people internal to edX, people outside of edX in the open community and collaborations therein, and so I'm going to highlight those quickly and then we'll bring uh, Jeff up onto the stage. So uh, in the last year, we released uh, something known as teams uh, and profiles. This is a combo feature. We had some lightweight profiles uh, last year, but we decided to embellish them in order to give teams a little bit more um, oomph. Teams are very small groups that are self-formed, um, uh, either topically or uh, through other um, demographics or other kinds of uh, ways in which you want to organize people inside your classroom or your course your virtual classroom, uh, the course, and uh, the idea behind Teams is that people uh, have an opportunity to meet up with one another in a more intimate way, that lets them feel connected to the course, possibly more motivated to complete the course material, but even just to uh, relate to other people in the course and uh, find a way to sort of socially glue people together um, inside the courseware in a way that is not often seems evident inside of MOOCs. It's in uh, use in one course today, uh, and it will be expanded as we uh, learn more about how this is going for that course and uh, really encourage people to take a look at the excellent documentation that's been written about this feature and to think about whether this is something that you want to enable in your courses. It's in the open repo just like a lot of our other features and it's also available um, for partners on edX.org. So teams and profiles always looking for feedback on that, particularly since it's a brand new feature that just got released. Uh, notes, this is exactly what it seems like, the ability for somebody to annotate a section of uh, the course material, to create a note for themselves as a piece of study guide, and then to go back and read through it at any time and use it in the way that um, it is needed for uh, recalling the information. And really, notes are completely open. There's zero structure there, just that it, there's a, an annotation, and it's associated with a piece of content. So a pretty simple feature, but a powerful one, and one that we've been asked about many, many times. and. Uh, and implemented and is in open edX today, and soon to be on edX.org. Bookmarks, similar kind of concept here, but a simpler even version of it, which is just to say, here's a bunch of places in the course content that I want to revisit. I'm going to quickly bookmark them and be able to look back at my bookmarks and say, oh yes, I want to review that content. I'm not going to review it right now, but I do want to review it later. Mark that content and then go back to it or mark something that's particularly important to the, um, you know, retain the information in the course or something you just want to review again. Bookmarking, again, very simple, but uh, clearly a feature that people were uh, begging us for and so we, we implemented that. And anything can be bookmarked. And you can see that there's Yay, that works. Um, you can see that they have two different kinds of indicators, both on the my bookmarks, but then it shows it right here in the little navigation, so that's handy. Uh, something that we really spent a lot of time trying to get right is cohorts. Uh, we had a project some time ago that was around group work that we were doing some specialized development for a, a client on, and really what that expanded into was a larger concept around just grouping in general inside of the LMS and trying to find a way to help people either through teams find each other and then make small groups or through cohorts allow the instructor or the course teams to group people in ways that made sense for whatever that kind of course was. So for example, if you want to show certain students certain content but not all the students, you can separate that content out and make it only available to certain cohorts. Right? So there is a way 
to sort of segment your content, segment your group, and specialize the learning experience just for those um, subgroups of people in the course. This could be expanded in any number of different interesting directions. It's, a, again, a very open feature that can be used however you think it might make sense in your course. It's an administrative feature, meaning that the faculty is in charge of how the, the people get con uh, cohorted into the course, and, um, and we're finding that people have really interesting different creative ways that they want to use that uh, feature to, again, make the course more intimate, make it smaller, make the groups inside of it not just the one big giant MOOC, but, you know, smaller groups that can interact with one another in these particular ways. Probably most of you know we put out some apps last year. I'm not sure that this is so much uh, new news, but uh, one thing I do want to highlight about our um, app development is that it's uh, hugely ongoing. I think as Namisha uh, talked about in the lightning talk, I don't see Namisha out there, um, in the lightning talks, there she is back in the back, uh, talked about in the lightning uh, round talks last, uh, last night. There are um, lots of exciting development coming in our apps. Notably, we're going to be introducing um, all of the textual content of the courses and assessments. And assessments is huge. We're going to start with a small set of very basic assessments to start and then expand outward from there. I think that there's a lot of yeah, debate about whether we'll ever get everything into the mobile app, but that's an open debate, which I'm happy to leave open for the moment and not satisfy the answer on. But for the most, uh, for right now, what we're trying to do is get um, at least the most basic kinds of content into our mobile experiences, and then see how far people go with those and you know how successful they can be without having absolutely every single thing inside the app, so we can keep it lightweight and easy for you all to pick up, modify, and, and make your own apps with. Content libraries, um, this was in limited release earlier this year. I think it was only used in a Knotts class for a couple of, uh, or one run, and so he gave us a lot of good feedback. And uh, now it's been released with some uh, modifications, some feature updates, and is available to everybody. And so the idea here is that if, um, Whatever your objective is for having content that is pulled out of a randomized pool, uh, whether that's to deter cheating or just really to be able to sample, right, to give people an opportunity to see a sample of questions and not just exactly the same answers across, or if you even want to test a whole bunch of different kinds of questions and you don't want to give everybody in the test the exact same set of questions, uh, randomized problem banks can be used to uh, seed uh, tests inside the, or quizzes inside of the uh, course and then you can, um, you know, sort of see the results across that pool and which ones are successful, which ones are not, which ones are good discerners, which ones are not, and again, it can also be used to help deter cheating. Uh, I don't know how many of you were able to go to uh, Victor's talk about uh, video insights, or about um, insights and uh, data and analytics work that we're doing, but in particular we released a new feature for the insights application, which is video analytics, and this has been a really exciting and long-awaited, um, but I think it was worth the wait feature for um, the insights team, and uh, it's just a fantastic way to understand how your videos are being used at a really granular level, and I think in a uh, powerful tool and many, many, many more interesting tools to come in the insights application, but this is one we wanted to highlight. There's, that team does a ton of, ton of work, but this is one of the big features that they released this year. I talked about yesterday the uh, third-party auth that was a just noting the contributors again here. Um, there was a lot of uh, good uh, discussion yesterday about SSO and third-party auth, and um, the OpenCraft team is here to answer questions if you want to do or you can always ask me. But it, essentially, the idea is that we have a OAuth 2 a service, and I've extended that into SAML Shibboleth and can uh, integrate with on-campus um, identity services and make it possible to log in with your campus credentials. So that was a big win for you know, our goal around campus um, campus application use. LTI tool provider, again, this is really to foster content reuse, much of which is being talked about in campuses as they both create MOOCs for the public scholarship goals that they have and want to be able to use that high quality content for other different kinds of uh, implementations for small courses uh, on campus or in blended experiences or for professional experiences. They really just want to be able to reuse the content at will. LTI is a, um, a tool that can help foster that. It's not the only way to do it, but it's a way and we implemented that uh, with our partners at, at Harvard and UBC and, and others who are in the campus applications working group. Finally, 
Hinting and feedback, again, I mentioned this briefly yesterday, and um, Ross had a great presentation about uh, this particular feature, um, and I just wanted to call it out again because I think it's a really exciting way for people to get into more interactivity in the assessments and be able to you know, give the teacher, there's still work to be done by the instructor, but to give the instructor a chance to really coach the student into um, the, the right result. That is it. For me, oh, sorry, there's one more slide. That oh, said 10 plus one. That was 10. This is the plus one. Birch and Cypress, but I think many of you already know that we're continuing our trajectory of offering uh, name releases. We released Birch. Cypress was really a big step up in the complexity and sophistication of the name releases. Dogwood is next. Uh, Eucalyptus is after that. Yes, he's nodding. I got the name right. And um, the tree theme persists. So without further ado, let me introduce Jeff Jaffe. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jeff Jaffe, CEO of the World Wide Web Consortium, which has created many of the standards that shape the modern web. In his role, Jeff evangelizes the W3C vision around the globe. And like Jeff, we believe that open web standards are critical to enabling broader access to knowledge and education for everyone. Please join me in welcoming Jeff to the stage, where he will share with us some of the exciting work he and the W3C are doing together. Thanks, Beth. We need net up here. <laughs> More juggling. Oh, this is it. Well, I always wanted to give a, a talk without slides, so uh, uh, maybe we'll have that opportunity. Oh, here we go. So close, so far. So Beth told you about my day job. Uh, I also moonlight as an edX student. And uh, in, in that role, I'm very excited about those 10 plus 1. So very, very good. Uh, I expect to learn much better now. So I was invited today to, give you a, to tell you a story, uh, to tell you the story about how uh, the edX platform and delivery mechanism has become the major element of W3C's uh, sharing of educational material to the web standards and the web development community. Uh, I'm going to do that story in three parts. Uh, first of all, I'll give you an introduction to what W3C is and, and the open web platform. Uh, I'll then emphasize our uh, focus on openness and then talk about our educational offerings. So in order to allow me to calibrate and uh, figure out how much time to spend on the first part of it. I'm curious how many people in the audience have heard of W3C? Ooh. Maybe one of you will give the presentation. Uh, how many of you are very much aware of what our role is in society and where we came about and so on and so forth? Okay, that's, that's more like about 40%. Uh, how many of you are really up to date on what we're driving nowadays? Uh, okay, so I think we'll spend some time on, on the first module after all. Uh, so let's start with that. Just the background. Uh, uh, famously, the web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in uh, 1989 and uh, quickly uh, took off like, like uh, wildfire. And uh, within about five years or so, um, Tim had to deal with a challenge. Uh, he wanted the web to become better. He wanted every innovator in the world to be able to contribute their innovations to the web. But he also wanted the web to remain open. And the concern in those days was that maybe there would be a well-funded company 
that would take the basic idea of a worldwide global information database and make it proprietary and try to grab a hold of it. And actually, in the history of the web, for those that know the history, there have been such attempts. So Tim came up with the idea of creating a consortium in which everybody would collaborate their best ideas in an open fashion uh, to enhance the technology base of the web. And, you know, if the web was one of Tim's best ideas, the web consortium was probably also one of his best ideas. Because if you look at the evolution of technology on the web, it's got a pretty good track record over the past 20 years or so. Uh, today we have over 400 members across the globe. Uh, Tim is the director of W3C, so he drives the technical agenda of the, of the web. We have 70 people on our team globally, which assist Tim in making sure that uh, we achieve our mission. Our mission is the very modest and undefined goal of leading the web to its full potential, whatever that means, at a particular point in time. We consider everyone in the world to be our stakeholders, which is why openness is so important to us. And uh, increasingly, we're focusing not only on the web as we all experience it as users, the open web, but also the fact that the web has become key to certain vertical industries. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing to support those industries as well. So it, it's developed into quite an, an interesting uh, 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 enterprise over the past 20 years. Uh, this is how it all started. Uh, Tim was writing down one day, gee, how do we get information shared amongst physicists? And from that, the idea just grew and grew until it became uh, uh, what it is today, which is basically the technology base for entertainment and commerce and education and sh information sharing and everything else that goes on. Uh, and to get from that diagram to where we are today obviously required uh, a lot of work. Just to give you a little bit of the uh, metrics that we look at to make sure that we're tied into the, uh, to, to our stakeholder community, um, we want to make sure we have a lot of members. So we have, uh, as I said, over 400 members. The, uh, I guess we added three in the last day or so. Um, and our, our members typically can be large commercial corporations, research laboratories, universities, startups, um, mid-sized companies, uh, just pretty much just about uh, everyone that you can imagine. Uh, the way our working groups work is we're open to everyone's ideas, but we want to make sure that large companies are there as well, because at the end of the day, what they develop, in fact, does have a pretty big impact on the evolution of web technology. So we specifically uh, track large commercial companies. That's what we call our full members. Uh, and that typically is, today, it's any company that you could think of in the web space, in the uh, information technology space, telecommunications, and smattering other industries as well. About four years ago, uh, we determined that we do a very good job when it comes to taking a mature technology to standardization in one of our working groups. We have about 50 working groups. Uh, about 1,500 engineers work in those working groups. And uh, they work across company in an open fashion to make sure that we can get standardization. But what we also discovered was that we were a very inhospitable place for new ideas, for research ideas, for pre-standardization. And so in 2011, we created a new kind of formulation under the W3C umbrella called community groups, which was a much more agile approach. Anyone with an idea could start a new group, and it would proceed very quickly to a specification. It wouldn't be considered a standard, because it didn't go through the broad acceptance that is required for W3C standards, but at least you could get started under the W3C um, umbrellas. So that's been very successful for us. In just four years, we have over 200 groups, which is four times the size of our standardization program. We have over 6,000 people participating, four times the number of engineers. So that's been very uh, successful for us. And we track other metrics as well, the number of Twitter followers, uh, past 100,000 in the last year or so, uh, and 
Of course, the number of developers that use web technology is in the millions, the number of websites is about a billion, so those are some of our uh, key metrics. Uh, today, uh, or, or I should say for the last five years or so, we've been looking at over a uh, tremendous transformation in the nature of what the web is all about. So the web that we all grew up with was a web of static documents that people wanted to share. And typically, they wanted to share that information uh, with other users on a computer or a desktop or a laptop. And that was pretty much it. That was the web for the first 10 or 15 years. Uh, today's web is quite different. Uh, there is, uh, it's not just boring text. It's rich multimedia information. Uh, the number and diversity of devices. There's all different kinds of smartphones that are available. Uh, we show web content on televisions through set-top boxes, uh, to the publishing industry through e-book readers, on, uh, in, in automobiles. So it, what we call today's web is the most interoperable platform in history. And most interesting about that is it's not just static documents. It's really a distributed operating system for building distributed applications across, uh, across uh, the world. So in the last few years, through our most recent set of standards, which HTML5 is the most known of those standards, uh, we've uh, substantially broadened the uh, technology base of uh, the web technology. So typically, what, it, what characterizes that is a bunch of APIs, or application programming interfaces, that allows any user on any part of the planet to access the capabilities of any system or any smartphone on a different side of the, the planet. Uh, and this indicates some of the capabilities that we have managed to surface through our APIs. Uh, the rich media we talked about, cross-device, uh, ability to have communications is, of course, extremely important between applications. And then very important to us is the recognition that we're working on a platform which isn't just a technical platform, but has to meet an increasingly demanding set of societal norms that people expect from the communications infrastructure of the planet. So uh, privacy and security have been in every single newspaper every single day. There was a recent summit uh, between the President of China and the President of the United States, where the main accomplishment was that they agreed to work on cybersecurity. So, so getting, um, you know, I think when we originally developed the web technology base, we didn't know, no one knew how pervasive it would become and how exposed it would become. So we work on standards not only to advance the technology of the web, but to protect security, to protect privacy, and the like. Accessibility is one of our key commitments. We believe in a web for all, uh, and roughly 15% of the population has various kinds of disabilities. And when vital services, including vital government services, are delivered to users only through the web, it better be accessible to everybody. And so we are constantly encouraging people to follow our accessibility gu guidelines. We're very pleased that edX is a leader in following the accessibility guidelines that we have. The other major thing that's happened to, uh, in our focus over the last several years is the industry focus, because the web technology base has become the technology base for certain industries. So uh, I probably don't have to tell you that, that people don't use the web just only to find out what's on television. But for certain demographics, the web is the major delivery mechanism for entertainment information. And so that brings a new set of requirements on web technology, because we have to not only be able to stream a YouTube, we have to be able to support uh, multiple streams simultaneously, bandwidth optimization, and a bunch of industry requirements, which are above and beyond consumer requirements. Another interesting industry uh, and I could talk about this all day, but I won't. I'll talk about only one more, is, is the publishing industry and how that's been affected by web technology. So when you think about what Tim's invention was 25 years ago, you could view it as nothing more 
than a new means of publishing. If I had information, instead of publishing it in the book, I could publish it on the web. It was different from traditional publishing because anyone could be an author. That wasn't available in traditional publishing. And I got massive immediate distribution of my information across the entire planet. That wasn't available in, in traditional publishing either. Those were the advantages. There were also disadvantages, like, you know, there was no decent fonts and you couldn't do graphics or anything like that. And it was, you know, it was just very primitive from the point of view of professional uh, publishing. But here we are 25 years later and basically everything that you can do with digital publishing, including advanced graphics and many different fonts and being able to do sophisticated things like in a, in a magazine where the text wraps around images and things like that. You can do all of that with web technology, but it's, you can do it interoperably, which means it can run on a vast variety of devices. And so people in the publishing industry are saying, gee, we want our next investments in publishing to be on the open web platform as well. So all of this has reformulated the way that we look at our technology stack. Instead of designing it from the bottom up as a bunch of engineers, how do we do better markup? We're now looking at it from the top down. The web technology stack is used by application developers who want to build sophisticated applications. And they don't want to hear about a bunch of angle brackets. They want to understand where in the technology platform do I get the key things that, that I need? Where's my multimedia su subsystem? Where's my security subsystem? If you view the web technology stack as analogous to an operating system, in an operating system there's a core set of low-level functions, such as process management, and task management, memory management, and then there are high-level sophisticated capabilities such as a GUI subsystem, a word processing subsystem, database and communications. So in the same way we need to evolve our web technology stack to a well-defined set of subsystem capabilities or what we call application foundations to make it easier for developers in the future. Part of the reason that I emphasize some of what we're doing here in W3C is because I'm trying to help illustrate the problem that we have in education. So there are a million web developers out there and they learned at some point in time, how to use HTML 3.2, or 4, or 4.1. But the, the, the pace of change of the web technology stack is enormous, and we've been struggling. How do we reach them? We have what you would characterize as a continuing education problem. We, we don't know who these people are. We never met them. We don't know how they learn their stuff. They're all different ages. And somehow or other, we're obligated to get them to upgrade their skills. How do we do that? So I'm not going to get to that yet. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, our approach to openness, uh, which I think also underlies kind of our framework and the way that we think of ourselves participating in an ecosystem with our communities. So about three years ago, uh, W3C, uh, the, I, the IEEE, uh, the IETF, that's the Internet Engineering Task Force, that's the organization that standardizes the lower level of the internet protocols, we got together and said, you know, we've been working on, some, on standards for some, some, for some time. We've taken a different approach than the de jure standard systems that have existed to help us standardize most aspects of our society, like, you know, AA batteries and the metric system and, you know, which years we have to add a sec second to the calendar and things like that. Uh, so there's this government-based standards organizations, um, such as the ITU and the ISO, and we've done things differently in standardizing the internet and the web. And it's worked out pretty well. Can we call out the principles that we've used for standardization and write that down somewhere so that way if other people want to look at developing their standards, they might consider doing the same. That resulted in an effort uh, which we announced about three years ago called OpenStand. We've now written down uh, what we think are the key 
principles uh, we extracted. What does IETF do? What does W3C do? Uh, we wrote it down uh, as a bunch of principles, and then in our case, you can, you can slip, click through the slides. We've done a self-evaluation, and not surprisingly, we're consistent with the way that we thought things should be done. Uh, what, what are the principles? There are five basic principles. Uh, one is uh, cooperation. So we're uh, not territorial. We're trying to enhance society. We're not trying to make one standards organization better than the other. W3C has 100 liaisons with different standards organizations that work on different parts of standardizing uh, typically a certain industry because our the, the web st technology stack uh, touches every industri industry. We have two things that I'll develop more in the next two slides, the five fundamental principles of standards development and collective empowerment. Availability, we're very big believers that if you develop a standard, you don't sell it. You make it available by putting it on your website. And voluntary adoption, so as opposed to government-oriented st standards, we think that things will catch on better if people adopt them voluntarily. The five principles of standards development, due process. So if, if anyone in the world uh, wants to say that the standard is wrong, they can write in a comment, they can make a complaint. And if a work group wants to standardize something, and someone thinks that they're really wrong, it's going to destroy the web if they put the parameters in this order rather than that order, or something like that. Uh, they can escalate the decision to Tim Berners-Lee. Tim is like an unbelievable director for W3C. Uh, the way that he directs most web technologies is by not being involved and by delegating it to uh, people who have ideas that want to work it out, to these thousands of people that I talked about earlier. But he's available for escalation, and everyone knows that, and that makes sure that people are focused on getting the best technical solution. Broad consensus, which means that we standard things, A, that have a consensus, and B, we don't require unanimity, as long as there's a consensus to do something. Transparency, our processes are documented and everyone understands how they work. You may have to balance between different considerations. And openness, as I said earlier, anybody can participate. Uh, the collective empowerment point, uh, first of all, we're looking for technical merit. So uh, many standards are based on countries voting one way or another. And in my experiences, I don't trust most countries, but I do trust the technical community based on technical merit to choose the best technical standards. Uh, we focus on the things that have become very important for the internet and for the web. Interoperability, scalability, stability and resiliency. A little bit more work that we require on stability, obviously. We want to enable global competition, so we don't want to help incumbents necessarily maintain incumbency. Building blocks for f further innovation and uh, benefiting humanity. Okay, let's turn to education. So. You know, for some time, I would say for the majority of the 20 years that we've uh, been in business at W3C, uh, we've recognized a responsibility to help the community implement the standards. One of our most popular tools are a bunch of open source tools called W3C validators, that if you want to take your markup and validate that it's valid, valid HTML, you run it through our HTML validator. and, and and then you can be sure that your, your, your website will be recognized by any of the, of, of the standard uh, browsers. But while we, we kind of limited ourselves to that for, for many of the years of our existence, uh, as I mentioned just five minutes ago, with the increased breadth, complexity of, the, uh, of, of our platform, uh, we decided about five years ago that we need to educate. And uh, education, like a, a huge dynamic range of who we have to reach to. So you have a non-programmer who we want, we still want it to be possible for a non-programmer to code up their website and be able to publish a website. 
And then on the other hand, we have a sophisticated developer who wants to build a mission critical application for some company. And there are people that need introduction to new material, and then there's a continuing education for the experienced web developer. So, you know, we decided five years ago we would decide we would become, you know, educators, and like we had no idea what we were doing. Well, like, where do we start? Like, it's, it's a very complicated demographic. It's not the kind of thing that we just start a course at MIT or something like that. So, so what do we do about it? So we, we thought about it and, um, you know, one of the things we thought about is, gee, maybe we should just uh, enable uh, other educators, give them a sign off. But, but, but what we heard from people is that they wanted the education to come directly from W3C. Uh, they wanted it to be state of the art. They wanted it to be correct because it's not too hard to get things imperfect. They wanted the authority and the expertise coming from W3C. So we launched something called W3 Dev Campus in 2011, uh, four years ago. How many people have heard of W3 Dev Campus? Two people. That was our problem. <laughs> so actually, many more people have heard of it than, than two. I'll tell you in a moment how many, but, but, but not enough. So, um, so we focused on professional education. We got ourselves, I think, experienced in what it meant to deliver education, how you would go about doing it, but we didn't really have uh, the platform, the technology base, or uh, the connections uh, to, to reach a massive audience. Nonetheless, we persisted. Uh, we started with a SPOC a small private online course. Uh, we created a bunch of courses that were uh, optimized for classes of 100 learners or less. Uh, we got some teachers to help with that. And I think we did pretty well. We, we developed 15 courses. We reached 4,000 students. Um, I mean, from a uh, standing start, um, I'm kind of proud of the team that did it. The only problem is it didn't achieve the mission. It didn't achieve the objective. Um, so, I mean, we, it was not only English. We got some uh, courses. We got some translations of the courses to, to various uh, other languages. This is obviously a worldwide community, but did not scale. So, uh, uh, earlier this year, you know, we kind of figured that we were hitting a wall and we needed to try something different. And that was when we uh, started to assess uh, different uh, MOOC uh, options. And uh, earlier this year, we decided to uh, partner with uh, edX, and we've been pretty happy with it. So we announced our first course in March 2015. Uh, and I guess not a lot of fanfare, because three months later, we launched the course. Uh, HTML5 Coding Essentials and Best Practices. It's kind of like a mid-level course, continue education for people who already are experienced HTML uh, uh, programmers. And 87,000 people enrolled in the course, which it's not a million, but pretty good start uh, um, for uh, a situation that we, that, that, you know, we had no pre previous experience with this. Of course, ha ha we needed the, the course content, so we leveraged the course content that we had put together in our SPOC, but then we had to remap it and revise it with the uh, advice and the guidance of the good people at edX uh, to what things would work in this kind of environment. And, um, and, and I'll tell you in the next several slides some of the things that we did and some of the things that were, were successful uh, for us and, and some of the areas that we need to do some further learning. In any case, by reaching 87,000 learners, um, I would say we achieved our target of scale. Uh, here are some interesting uh, metrics. Um, we had um, what we continued, what we consider to be probably the continuing education group, more so is the 26 and up. 
And so about 65% were 26 and up. So we, we got a, a pretty good range in terms of the age demographics. Also, a respectable number of entry, median age of 29. On gender diversity, um, we, we could have done better. Uh, a little bit less than 20% of respondents self-identified as female. Uh, I don't think that's a problem with our course or the delivery. I think, unfortunately, it's a problem with the gender diversity of people in the programming profession, which is a larger problem that society faces. But in any case, it's something that we need to continue to look at and make sure that there isn't anything which is discouraging. Quite the contrary, we want to make sure that we're encouraging and we can become uh, an element to help the uh, gender uh, imbalance. Um, and uh, I'm doing my part. My, my daughter is a programmer, so uh, my small part. <laughs> um, in terms of geographic global reach, uh, we we're very impressed. Uh, we reached 197 countries. Uh, top six are listed here. No surprise, four of the top six are English language speaking countries, US, India, well, US, most, much of India, uh, UK and Canada, and uh, then Spain, Brazil, the other two. Um, the, the course is given in English. Um, so we, we were pretty pleased to see that. Um, Four percent of the students were from the African continent, so I guess 4% of 87,000 is a, about uh, uh, 4,000 or 3,000 or something like that. There is no way that we would have reached 3,000 students in, 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 in Africa. So we certainly achieved our target of global reach. Um, did people's skill and knowledge improve with this course? Um, so of course, uh, I, I guess probably some people, the answer was no and they didn't fill out the survey. So I, I don't know that uh, we have a, uh, a completely accurate survey, but of the 1,700 people that answered, so that's about 2% answered, um, they all got better skills and knowledge. And 2%, I think, uh, often people don't answer surveys. So I don't think 2% is a bad number. And uh, in general, uh, very positive feedback about improving skills and knowledge. Uh, some of the feedback, you know, thank you for this course. I now have a new web design agency. So that's really good. Uh, help with the unemployment rate, I guess. Uh, a lot of people said five-star review for the content and for the teacher and the provider. Um, there was a lot of information packed into this course. I mean, it was a it was self-study, people did it at their own pace, but there was a lot of information uh, packed into this course. Um, how much video should we use? Um, so, you know, we were a little concerned, you know, a lot of stuff is put out in the, in, in the tech world, a lot of stuff is put out very dry. You know, here's the text, here's some examples, just work it out. So we tried to find the right balance. We tried to adjust the balance as we went through the course. That was another nice thing about the platform is the ability to readjust as we went through the course. So um, typically in each module, the course instructor, Michelle Bufa, would give a nice teaser, trying to, you know, here's some really good things you're gonna learn to, to, to drag people in. That worked pretty well. Uh, and then, you know, it wasn't just here's the facts, but he actually worked through on a video uh, coding examples in great detail to leverage some of the advanced features. I think students seeing that and be a, being able to exercise that really benefited greatly as a means uh, of instruction. Uh, and then they went to the discussion forums uh, to work on the exercises and do even harder examples. So it's very nice, makes it built a very nice dynamic community. Of course, it was important that we had the instructor and other W3 staff, staff participating in the discussion forum. Um, uh, some obvious stuff, having a teacher that's passionate about teaching. Uh, Michelle Bufa is just, just a star, great pedagogical skills. Uh, and social media, we were very active with social media as well. 
So all of that was just one course. Uh, and we have big plans. So um, first of all, by popular demand, we are rerunning that course. Uh, and we just started that uh, notification a couple of weeks ago. Uh, when I submitted these slides, there were 38,000 enrollees. As of this morning, it was 41,000 enrollees. So um, I guess the 1 million minus 87,000 people who hadn't taken the course the first time, a bunch of them are taking it the second time. But we've also learned a little bit about the uh, business model of how to deliver courses through edX. Again, through the advice of our colleagues, they said, you know, if instead of calling it HTML5 kind of, uh, here's some advanced examples, best practices, if you call it part one and part two, you build it into a series, you encourage people to take the multiple courses, you build a, con a constant commitment to the con continuing education, you really build education into the whole nature of the profession of being a web developer. And so we're going to investigate with a whole bunch of concepts like that, uh, having uh, a series of courses which we call the X series, having additional co courses, CSS, uh, now drop it down a little bit, an introductory course, an HTML5 for dummies, some more advanced courses on semantic web. We're trying to find some funding to give an accessibility course because that's extremely important to us. Uh, and those are some of the partnerships and sponsorships that we're looking to develop in the future. So I'm happy to take your questions if there are questions for a few minutes, but just to summarize, um, W3C is the organization for standardizing uh, the web technology stack. Uh, we do it in a very open way. It's been working pretty well, but it's gotten more complicated given the complexity of the technology stack, the diversity of devices, the importance of industry, societal concerns, and the like. And with all of that, we need to keep a, a community of a million developers up to date on the latest thing. And uh, at least our initial experience with edX, with W3C on edX, which we call W3CX, uh, uh, has been uh, very successful. And we're hoping to continue and uh, improve the, the partnership over time. Thank you. And if there are questions. If there are no questions, I'll start calling on people. <laughs> uh, yes? So what technologies did you say you're excited about? Question was, what technologies am I excited about? So I told you about a bunch of them. So I'll tell you about the ones I didn't tell you about, just, just to do something different. So two of the biggest things that we're working on is uh, Web of Things and Web Payments. Uh, how many of you have heard about the Internet of Things? It's like it's in all the press. How many of you have heard about the Web of Things? Nobody. Oh, two people. OK. So I got to work on my marketing department. So, so here's the thing with the Internet of Things. Like, we're going to create an internet where everything in the factory is enabled to be on the internet. They're going to get an IP address. And then we'll build factory automation apps for that application. We're going to instrument every single road in town for traffic. And then we're going to build some traffic apps by putting every road, every kilometer, on the internet, but build a bunch of apps like that. We're going to take personal med medical devices, our Fitbits, and we're going to put them on the internet. And then we're going to have a bunch of medical apps. So that's what the Internet of Things is all about. So one of the things that we learned with the World Wide Web initially is that if you can agree on the data formats and you can agree on publishing open data, 
then long term, the sharing that comes from that is a big winner. And by contrast, if you don't have open data, you're going to end up stovepiping your applications and, and, and you will not be able to have good sharing. So, so we think that the Internet of Things is headed for a train wreck and it's because the entire focus is on stovepiped applications without people worrying about how do we effectively share data about these sensors and medical devices and watches and everything else in a way that can be shared across the entire web for different applications. So we have started a new project just the last few months called the Web of Things to try to get together all the people that are working on the Internet of Things and get them focused on the fact that we need a common set of data models. So that's one project that we're working on. That's a project which we're hoping to be timely with. Web payments is a project that we are very untimely with. So one of the main things that people do on the web is they buy stuff. Now, when the web started, it had a distinctly non-commercial nature to it. And we never worried about standardizing how you pay for things on the web. And the result is that every single website does it differently today. And it's getting a lot worse because now we have a whole bunch of people out there that want to build web applications and they want to, I mean these are people in a garage, they want to build a simple web application. They want a standard way to get paid without having to figure out a unique way to do payments for themselves. Plus existing payment systems are kind of known for their lack of security, which is kind of a problem because like every month some other company confesses that all the credit card numbers have been stolen. So, so uh, about a year ago we started an effort which has really taken us to a different place in W3C to see if we can figure out how to standardize web payments. I mentioned earlier how vertical industries are driving a lot of our attention, earlier, uh, attention such as the entertainment sector and the publishing sector. So here the financial services sector and the retail sector is, are another two sectors that have gotten extremely interested in figuring out how to work with us and standardizing some new uh, frameworks that will help them in their industries. I could have planted that question. Thank you. Uh, yes? Uh, the question was, is there anything that work for, works for adaptive bitrate video? So, um, in the past, uh, most of the uh, video standards were done uh, in the MPEG organization, not in W3C. Uh, and I, I think the reason for that is because it was viewed that there are many different applications for uh, compression and, and technologies of, uh, of those forms. Um, W3C has never adopted um, a, uh, an MPEG standard as something that we rely on in W3C because one of our commitments to openness is that we uh, were committed to having a core web set of web technologies that are royalty free. So all of the 400 companies that participate in W3C participate on a royalty free basis. So we have some of the largest patent holders in the world. Um, are members of W3C and if they make a lot of money on their patents that's fine with us as long as it's not on the core web because we think that the core web should be an open infrastructure that everybody can use as equally um, and patents should be for a different place. Uh, MPEG by, by contrast their most popular uh, standards like H.264, H.265 are, uh, are heavily encumbered by, by patents and so we will not recognize them. There is some movement in that area uh, last month, uh, a bunch of companies, uh, including uh, Google, who owns YouTube, and uh, Cisco and Microsoft, uh, announced the creation of an open media alliance. And their intent is to create an unencumbered patent, uh, un unencumbered um, codec, uh, which is patent free based on W3C uh, uh, royalty free commitments. So we'll see how that goes. But you know, that's, that's just, just barely starting now. Yes? I know the uh, uh, EPUB 
group have a, uh, a subgroup working on education and you pub. Uh, does W3C have any working groups that are focused on education on the web? Yeah, so um, we actually work very closely with um, uh, IDPF, which is the standards organization that created the EPUB standard. Uh, uh, part of our, I, I talked earlier about uh, cooperation being one of our key uh, um, responsibilities. IDPF is actually a member of W3C, and W3C is actually a member of IDPF. Uh, so so um, we, we collaborate a lot of this stuff, like the EduPub stuff. Um, I, I, we, we offered some support for, the, for that when they announced the EduPub Alliance. Um, uh, we don't have any actual standards track work going on in W3C in educational technology, but we do have, remember I mentioned the community groups, which are pre-standardization, a bunch of people want to develop some ideas not yet ready to be standardized. We have some community groups that are focused on uh, educational technology, educational publishing. There is time for one more question, and you're, you're the person who's going to ask it. Uh, can you say something about where the uh, standard for open education stands, or where it is in the pipeline if it's kind of ready for the spec of presentation? Uh, I, I don't have the uh, uh, exact uh, answer for that. The question was, what's the status of the open annotations uh, standard? Uh, we started an open annotations working group about 15 months or so ago. Um, and the way our standards develop, there's a first public working draft when you get started. It's called the candidate re recommendation when you're ready to get implementations and then a couple of other steps and, until it becomes a formal standard. Uh, I, they're definitely past first public working draft. They're definitely not at recommendation. I don't think they've gotten to candidate rec rec recommendation yet or not. I, I don't think they've gotten there, but I'm not 100% sure. You can just, I guess, check the website. And uh, uh, it, the information should be there. That's usually available on the website. OK, I'm told that I'm out of time, which is good because you're out of questions. So thank you very much for your time today. And have a good afternoon. Hey everyone, I'm back. I'm gonna keep you here for another couple minutes. Thanks, Ned. Your positivity is always refreshing. If I can figure out how to use computers. in doubt, unplug it and plug it back in. Trying to get it on the computer. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what a way to end. Okay, well, we'll just do this without a uh, slide deck. Um, so we are uh, wrapping up the uh, plenary session here uh, right now. Uh, after this, we'll have the unconference. So uh, Immediately following this, just head back to Tishman where you had lunch, and uh, our community manager, Molly DeBlanc, will uh, give a lovely introduction to the unconference process and uh, encourage you all to form uh, working groups to discuss uh, the topics that are foremost on your mind. I'm sure many of you have been doing that uh, informally, but hopefully this will give you an opportunity to find people you haven't been able to find yet and uh, have some really productive conversations. Uh, who here is going to the hackathon tomorrow? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's great. 
All right, so um, I wanted to put up uh, on the slide the uh, schedule, but uh, I'm just gonna tell you uh, right now. Um, so we are uh, starting breakfast at eight. Um, it is downtown, uh, in downtown Boston at uh, what's called the CIC Boston. Confusingly, the acronym means the uh, Cambridge Innovation Center, but it's in Boston. So um, it's Boston uh, 50 Milk Street. It'll be on the 17th floor. Um, all of the details are on the wiki. We'll make sure to, to post a link to, to that um, on Twitter, just in case uh, you haven't seen it already. Um, so we'll do breakfast 8 to 9, and then opening presentations from 9 to 10, uh, and then we will get hacking from 10 on. Um, so go forth uh, to the unconference, and I will see a bunch of you again. Well, see a bunch of you there, and then I'll see a bunch of you again uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, so thanks.